David Cole's uh, book centers on three American stories and their fight to change constitutional law. Evan Wilson, a law school student dealing with marriage equality. Marion Hammer, a gun enthusiast in Florida on gun rights. Michael Ratner, a civil rights lawyer uh, in the post 9-11 era of dealing with human rights in the war on terror. Uh, much of the buzz about this book has picked up following Justice Scalia's death and the ensuing, ensuing struggle for the preservation of the status quo in the Supreme Court. Um, the Washington Post, as a bow to this book's effectiveness, suggests a title change um, in the edges that, uh, quote, the engines of liberty could have just as easily chosen a more superhero-y title, like Guardians of Liberty, because it is a story in which each of its protagonists with a heart of gold and nerves of steel fights for truth, justice, and the American way. David Cole is the honorary George J. Mitchell Professor in Law and Public Policy at Georgetown University Law Center, a leading civil liberties lawyer. He is the author of No Equal Justice and Enemy Aliens, which won the American Book Award. He has written for the New York Review of Books, New York Times, Washington Post, New Yorker, Atlantic Nation, and Wall Street Journal, among others. So without further ado, will you uh, join me in welcoming David Cole. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, uh, you know, of course, I'd like you to buy the book, but it's more important to buy as many books as possible to support this institution, which is uh, one of the most important institutions in, the, uh, in D.C., in my view, uh, and sort of an endangered species. And even more endangered, practically extinct, uh, are the CD uh, sales uh, rack there, <laughs> which uh, is my favorite part of the bookstore, and we need to keep it going. So uh, pick something up on the way out. Um, so uh, this is a book about the power of small groups of committed people to change our nation's most fundamental uh, law. Uh, and while we often tend to think of the Supreme Court as the entity that changes uh, constitutional law, that makes constitutional law through its interpretations, I argue in the book that the court doesn't so much change constitutional law as recognize that it has changed and that the drivers of that change are the people themselves. So to, to address this question of how does constitutional law actually operate, how does it actually uh, uh, change, I looked at what I consider the three most successful constitutional change campaigns in the last 40 years or so. So how did marriage equality go from unthinkable, which is what it was, say 30 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago, to inevitable, which is what it was when the Supreme Court decided the case uh, in 2015. How did the notion that uh, the Second Amendment protects an individual right to bear arms and not the state's prerogative to um, have uh, militias go from uh, something that Chief Justice Warren Burger dismissed as a fraud uh, in 1991 to a constitutional right in 2008. And what caused uh, President George W. Bush to curtail most of his rights infringing counterterrorism measures in the, um, by the end of his uh, time in office, given the history of presidents getting away with uh, virtually anything they want with respect to the enemy uh, in uh, wartime? And I argue that behind each of these developments was a small group of committed people, or several small groups of committed people. In the case of the NRA, one large group of committed uh, uh, people who, um, who came together around a particular vision of the Constitution, one that was not reflected in the law as it stood when they began, um, but uh, engaged in a variety of tactics and strategies to make constitutional law in their image, essentially. Um, so uh, if somebody hadn't already kind of taken uh, this term, the subtitle of the book might have been The Power of Citizens United to Make Constitutional <laughs> Law. So I, I begin with uh, Evan Wolfson, uh, who as a Harvard Law student in 1983 wanted to write a paper uh, on the constitutional right to um, gay marriage. And he went around to all the um, constitutional law professors at Harvard, and not one of them would supervise it because they thought it was so off the wall, um, frivolous. Uh, he finally found a trust in a states professor to uh, supervise it, 
He wrote a 141-page paper, but he didn't stop there. He then went out, uh, became a lawyer with Lambda Legal Defense Fund, one of the principal gay rights organizations in the, uh, in the country. He, he started their marriage uh, project. In 2002, he then left there and created a, a group called Freedom to Marry, which became a multi-million dollar uh, nonprofit focused solely on r marriage recognition for, uh, for gay and lesbian couples. And it didn't file a single lawsuit. Uh, it filed a few amicus briefs, but it, fo it focused its efforts and its energies on all the work that needed to be done to change the ground so that the, law the arguments in court um, uh, could, uh, uh, could succeed. Uh, and Evan Wolfson didn't do it alone. Freedom to Marry didn't do it alone. There were a, a number of organizations, the ACLU, GLAD, um, marriage, state-based uh, marriage equality organizations that all worked together. So what did they do? Um, again, they didn't file a federal lawsuit. Some people did file federal lawsuits. And in fact, in 1972, uh, a gay couple filed a petition to the Supreme Court arguing that they had a right to uh, marry on the same terms and conditions as heterosexual couples, and the Supreme Court dismissed it in a single sentence, uh, saying it doesn't raise uh, doesn't raise a substantial federal uh, question. Uh, so they weren't going to file a, a, a case in federal court, making all the arguments that Evan Wolfson had made in his 141-page paper, because if they did, they would simply get dismissed. There wasn't the, the arguments were not w would not succeed. So instead, what they did was they pursued a, a kind of incremental federalist strategy using the fact that there are 50 states, that each of the states has its own laws that uh, deal with uh, marriage, uh, that some of the states are more progressive than other states, and so they sought to change law in the states, sort of one step at a time and one state at a time, uh, so that they could change the ground on, uh, against which the Supreme Court would eventually address the question. So they changed law and family law. Uh, they got family law reforms to recognize parental rights of, uh, of gay couples, for example. They um, got dom limited domestic partnership benefit uh, um, provisions, first from corporations and then from some progressive municipalities and then from states, and then they sought to expand those. They uh, sought non-discrimination ordinances and, and uh, hate crimes ordinances that recognized discrimination against gays and lesbians as, uh, uh, as actionable. And only after they had done all that did they go into court. And they went into state court, not federal court. They wanted to stay out of federal court. They went into state court and made uh, the argument under state, various state law constitutional provisions that they had a right uh, to marry. And when they won, and they, and they picked their states, uh, you know, Vermont was the first uh, state, uh, the second was uh, Massachusetts. They picked their states carefully. They were states where there had been a lot of progress, where there was progressive support, uh, and where it might be difficult for the opposition in, in a backlash to overturn uh, what they won, if they won. Um, and they then, with, with respect to each victory, they then did, in fact, have to fight uh, in the public arena, a referenda to, that, were, that attempted to overturn those decisions. Um, but it was really that work uh, that, that shifted the ground from 1972 to 2015 and made it possible for the court in 2015 to recognize marriage equality. Arguments weren't any different. It wasn't that the, you know, the lawyers com somehow came up with some new clever arguments. The arguments were the same in 72 and 2015, but the ground against which those arguments were viewed had uh, shifted uh, dramatically again primarily through the work of people outside of the courts. And there's a similar story with respect to the right to bear arms uh, and the NRA. And I, I, I covered uh, them in part because my point is not that citizen activism leads constitutional law in some pro towards some progressive nirvana, but rather that it's, the, it's where the action is. And uh, if there are committed uh, groups of uh, citizen activists who favor con conservative views, they're likely to succeed uh, as, as well. So the NRA, what's the secret of the NRA's uh, success? And it has been successful. I think it's probably the most effective civil liberties organization in the United States. I think it, the secret to its success is that it understands the inextricable link between constitutional rights uh, and democratic engagement. Um, 
like the gay rights groups, it did not file cases in federal court. It knew it would lose. For a hundred years, the federal courts had said there's no right to uh, individual right to bear arms under the Second Amendment. It uh, only protects the prerogative of the states. So they went, again, to the states. And I feature in the book Marion Hammer, who's a, um, a woman who's now in her mid to late 70s. She's four foot 11. Uh, she never went to law school, and she's probably the most powerful lobbyist in Florida. And Florida is the most gun-friendly state in the uh, country, so much so that it's um, sometimes referred to as the gunshine state. Uh, and, and so the NRA starts its battles there, it, w whether it's about uh, concealed carry uh, permitting or whether it's about stand your ground self-defense laws or whether uh, it's about immunity for uh, gun manufacturers from lawsuits filed by people who, uh, uh, who are injured through illegal use of, uh, of their products. Um, uh, it started in Florida, and then they uh, expand it uh, from there. And the NRA uh, uh, grades every elected official uh, in the country at the state and federal level on their commitment uh, to guns. And then it decides who to favor in elections based on that uh, on that factor alone, regardless of, uh, of party uh, affiliation. It then follows those uh, legislators to make sure that they stay true to their commitments, and if they depart, um, they, uh, they go after them. Uh, so through this kind of work, by the time the question had gotten to the Supreme Court in 2008, the NRA had succeeded in getting an, a right to bear arms, an individual right to bear arms, recognized in virtually all of the states. So there was already an individual right to bear arms, making it a lot less of a step for the court to say there's a federal um, right to bear arms. Uh, they had also gotten the academic literature shifted from uh, a view which prevailed until the NRA got involved in supporting scholars uh, per, uh, that took the view that it was only about states' prerogatives and not individual rights. By the time it went to the Supreme Court, the majority of law review articles took the position that there is an individual right. And a number of prominent liberal constitutional law professors had uh, espoused that view, including Sandy Levinson, Larry Tribe, Akhil Amar, um, uh, and the uh, uh, like. They had also gotten Congress on board uh, recognizing an individual right to bear arms in preambles to two pieces of gun legislation. And they had gotten the Justice Department, the executive branch, on board when John Ashcroft became the Attorney General. He revert, at their request, he reversed the, um, the longstanding Justice Department position that there was no individual um, right to bear arms. And then my, my favorite uh, thing they did was when the case got to the Supreme Court, the Heller, uh, Heller versus D.C., got to the Supreme Court, they arranged for an amicus brief to be submitted on behalf of the individual rights view uh, that, uh, and uh, challenging the uh, D.C. Uh, gun law, on behalf of a majority of the House of Representatives, a majority of the senators, and Dick Cheney. Uh, and the Dick Cheney part is pretty remarkable because the Bush administration was defending the D.C. law. Uh, and Dick Cheney filed a brief opposing uh, the uh, law. So that says something about Dick Cheney, of course, but it also says something about the NRA's power. And even after the court recognized the right to bear arms in, uh, in 2008, uh, it is the NRA, uh, not the court, that is the most effective protector of gun rights. It succeeds in blocking laws like the universal background check law that, uh, that President Obama pushed uh, that would clearly be constitutional if they were enacted, and it, um, it gets enacted all kinds of protections that are not um, constitutionally uh, required. Uh, so that, and then the, the last story is, really, is about the uh, human rights in the, uh, in the war on terror. As I said, the history of wars is that courts and Congress and people defer to the president with respect to how they deal with the enemy uh, during wartime. And here I feature Michael Ratner of the Center for Constitutional Rights, um, who was the person who first filed a, a, a lawsuit on behalf of Guantanamo Bay detainees, arguing that they had a right to a day in court. I asked him, you know, what do you think your chances were of prevailing in that case when you filed it? He said, completely hopeless. We filed 100% on principle. Uh, and he was right, because the law was against him, 
The politics were against him. Um, uh, and, but they didn't just file a lawsuit. They also, again, engaged in a range of, uh, of advocacy campaigns outside of the federal courts that framed up the issue so that by the time it got to the court, it was really a question about the rule of law versus lawlessness. Uh, and if that's the question that's put to the court, it's not all that surprising that the court sides with the version of the rule of law. And here they couldn't really use the states as kind of laboratories for advancing new constitutional ideas because the states have nothing to say uh, about our national security or very little to say. They're preempted. But what they did do was they used international fora. And they went, uh, I, I, I feature another guy, Clive Stafford Smith, who represented 85 Guantanamo detainees. Uh, I think about 70 plus of them have been released. Not one by virtue of a court order. What Clive did uh, was he filed habeas cases, but he also flew to the countries from which the Guantanamo detainees came, uh, gathered up their family members, uh, held press conferences, uh, brought public attention to bear on the plight of their nationals uh, detainees, which then put pressure on their governments uh, to put pressure on the United States. Uh, and the first target was the UK. Tony Blair was fully supportive of, of George Bush and fully supportive of, the, uh, of Guantanamo at the outset, but through the advocacy of Clive Stafford Smith and Reprieve and um, uh, a, a number of other organizations and groups, they turned around public opinion uh, and they therefore forced Tony Blair to turn around. He demanded the release of the uh, of the British detainees from Guantanamo. They were released before the Supreme Court heard argument in the Guantanamo cases uh, and told their stories. Those stories included uh, torture. Uh, and then in the first Guantanamo uh, arguments, which had nothing to do with torture, uh, Paul Clement was asked, arguing for the government, was asked about torture. Uh, and he, he said, uh, well, we don't do that. Uh, and, and that, that the, the evening that he said uh, our government doesn't, do, doesn't torture, the Abu Ghraib uh, photos came out. So, um, uh, so the, this kind of international uh, organiz organiz organizing was key to both revealing what was going on and portraying what was going on as a, a, a battle between law and uh, lawlessness. So um, in all three instances, uh, the way constitutional law changed and the way practices changed was through work of committed citizens acting primarily outside the courts. My argument isn't that courts are irrelevant. Uh, they obviously play a very important role, especially the DC Circuit, but, uh, but, 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 rather, but rather that the impetus for change, uh, the driver for change uh, is uh, people. Uh, working together in civil society. So what lessons uh, might we draw uh, from this? First is that constitutional law is uh, a great deal more democratic uh, than is conventionally understood. It is not so much imposed top-down by judges with life uh, tenure uh, as built from the bottom up by citizens engaged in democratic uh, participation. Second, that civil society groups play a critical role in the way constitutional law evolves. We often talk about the living constitution. I think the civil society groups are an embodiment of the living and indeed lived uh, uh, constitution. Groups like CCR, the NRA, Freedom to Marry are the real catalysts for constitutional change. Third, if you care about the Constitution, therefore, you ought to get engaged uh, and work with those organizations that uh, share your values, because that is a principal um, determinant of whether your values will, in fact, be recognized in our, uh, in our constitutional law. As learned hand, the greatest judge uh, never to sit on the Supreme Court uh, said, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. While it lies there, it needs no constitution, no court, uh, no law uh, to save it. Now, that's an overstatement. Uh, I think we need a constitution. We need courts. 
um, but I think it's uh, it's it's perceptive and insightful with respect to the where the where liberty must ultimately lie uh, in us. And I think one of the things that civil society gr groups do is uh, nurture that um, the liberty that lies in our in our hearts. So I close the book, and I'll close this uh, these remarks with a quote from uh, Cornell West and Roberto Unger that has guided me um, for much of my uh, career. And they write, um, hope is more the consequence of action than its cause. As the experience of the spectator favors fatalism, so the experience of the agent produces hope. Uh, so, and what I think they mean by that is, you know, it's easy to be skeptical uh, from the sidelines. And I think some of our most committed cynics are just that, armchair cynics. But their point is not that hope drives people to action, but it's the other way around. Action uh, creates uh, hope. So my ultimate uh, message in this uh, book is that we can all be agents of hope, and that constitutional law depends on our doing so. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions, or we can just break for <laughs> David. Hi, David. Uh, David Stern. Um, and my question is, when a lot of the cases came after Evan Wolfson had laid some of the groundwork that you're describing. I think there was nervousness, if my recollection is right, that it wasn't ripe yet. And there was especially concern when the David Boy's um, lawsuit was being contemplated um, that, that the timing was not right. Right. And so I'm a little curious about now, of course, we look back and we say, oh, yeah, it worked. But it, it could have had the opposite effect. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. So, yeah, the, 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 all of the gay rights groups that had been working together and very carefully and strategically and incrementally um, on marriage took the view that you don't want to go to the Supreme Court until you've built sufficient momentum, you've changed the ground sufficiently that you're confident about winning. Uh, and so they had met um, uh, when the California, the question of marriage in California was at issue, they had met and decided uh, it is not ripe to file a federal lawsuit. We, they, had, they had, all of the cases uh, up till then had been state law cases in state courts. They had avoided federal claims precisely because they wanted to stay out of uh, federal court. And so, uh, and they felt that it was too early, that uh, at that time there were only, I think, three states that had actually recognized constitutional, uh, uh, constitutionally uh, same-sex marriage as a right. Uh, it was too early to go to the court, and they went to David Boys and um, Ted Olson and said it's too early, and David Boys and Ted Olson said, well, thank you very much for your uh, views, but we're going to go ahead and file anyway, which is all, you know, always a problem when you live in a free country. But, um, but what's and, and, and that case may well have been too early. Um, you know, in, in the end, that case, which was a challenge to Proposition 8, which was in turn a referendum that overturned the California Supreme Court's decision recognizing marriage, um, that case the Supreme Court dismissed on standing ground, so it didn't have to reach the merits. And they might not well have been ready to reach the merits. And instead, they reached the merits that year in the DOMA case, which was, a, as I talk about in the book, a narrower, a much narrower claim. Um, and then on the back of the DOMA decision, there was a flood of litigation in which, and a flood of federal courts saying, uh, indeed, there is a right to marriage. And so by the time it came up the second time, it was timely. Interestingly, the, the NRA had the same view about the Heller case. They were, uh, they fought very hard to stop the group that was, that filed the Heller case because they felt that they hadn't yet done sufficient groundwork to bring the, the claim to the Supreme Court. They, they wanted it, you know, they wanted the right, but they felt that they needed uh, uh, more work. And they, you know, they were probably uh, right. They won five to four. Um, when the suit was filed, Justice O'Connor uh, was on the court. The, the NRA's uh, head lobbyist told me that um, he, he, th they had information that Justice O'Connor would not have been friendly to their uh, claim. But by the time the case got to the court, O'Connor had stepped down, Rehnquist had died, uh, 
that the NRA had played a critical role in getting George Bush elected, both in 2000, uh, uh, when was he elected? 2000 and 2004, uh, and then George Bush appointed two gun rights uh, favorable justices, Alito and Roberts, and you, you needed them because they won uh, five to four. So. Um, yeah, so when you're engaged in this kind of incremental campaign, it's dangerous to go too quickly to the court, and both, both the gay rights groups and the gun rights groups felt that. Excuse me. Thank you for writing this book. Uh, I have one question, though. I see a difference between gun rights and the other two. In that, in so the do most of the people in the room. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. In the the power and money of the gun manufacturing industries, yeah. which I find hard to distinguish from the NRA. Yeah, great question. And I address that question in the book. And I, you know, um, the NRA does have a lot of money. Uh, it's, uh, it has a uh, annual revenue of about $300 million a year. That's pretty good for a nonprofit entity. But what, I've, what was interesting, what, I've, what, what I found, uh, two things were interesting about this. One, of that $300 million, they spend only about 10 percent on political lobbying, you know, um, legal uh, activity. The other 90 percent is spent on servicing their members, um, the ra gun ranges, teaching gun safety and the like, the sort of core conduct-related stuff that they, they have always done. Um, and, and secondly, um, of that $300 million, about somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of that is gun industry money every year. So 90 to 95 percent of that money comes from individuals, mostly from their members. They have 5 million members. Uh, they also have 15 million people who think they're members but don't pay their dues. <laughs> and the NRA actually doesn't mind. They like to have the dues. But they more want them to do what the NRA asked them to do. And um, a number of, uh, of people who have looked at this, and, I, and I, I concluded the same, have concluded that the power of the NRA really lies in its people uh, and, its, and, its people, and, and its members' willingness to engage um, uh, more so than uh, in money. That, that said, you know, it, it is true that it takes, it takes money to do anything in, in, in the United States uh, these days. Um, the gay rights group spent a lot of money, raised a lot of money, and spent a lot of money. And you know, at one point, and my my book is a story about the power of people. But you could say, you know, a cynic might say, it's not about the power of people; it's about the power of money. Um, but I think uh, what ha what happened in both of those cases was that money followed the ideas. That people supported the gay rights groups with respect to marriage only once they. Uh, had been successful in changing minds about the status of gays and lesbians, about their dignity, and about the, um, the justice of their, of their claim. And similarly with the NRA, people support the NRA because they believe in, in, in the NRA. Not, it's not a, a few you know, rich individuals who, uh, who run the show. Um, now, Jane Mayer is here and, and has written a, a great book about how there are a few rich individuals <laughs> who happen to run a lot of shows. But, uh, but at least with respect to this, these two stories, it's not the case. It's not the case with respect to human rights and the war on terror either. Um, I mean, interestingly to me, both the ACLU and the Center for Constitutional Rights, which are two of the most important groups in this, in this uh, struggle, um, they each doubled their budgets in the early days of the war on terror. Uh, so they got a lot more money. But why did they get a lot more money? Because people were concerned about what George Bush was doing, and they wanted, they put their money where their mouth was, they wanted uh, somebody to stand up uh, against them. And, and, you know, that's always the case. You know, if, if, if Hillary Clinton, well, uh, if Bernie Sanders is elected, it'll be very bad times for the ACLU and the C NCCR. Uh, you know, if, if, if uh, uh, Cruz is elected, they will have uh, lots of work. Uh, and lots of money. And, and in a way, you know, the, so here money actually works as a kind of independent check on uh, threats to our constitutional rights and liberties. When we see that our liberties are, at, uh, you know, endangered, we tend to support those groups that are fighting for them. Mike. Great talk, David. Um, <laughs> your, your last comment made me think, after Ronald Reagan was elected, I think the nation doubled its circulation yeah, exactly. <laughs> in a year. Um, 
But you uh, you talk maybe wonder about some earlier historical parallels in many ways, um, uh, which didn't end up working through the amendment process as opposed to uh, the court, but they worked on a state level. I'm thinking of prohibition and women's suffrage, which yeah. which you know used some of the same. They went through the states. They had many different state campaigns. They changed laws in the states first. Um, but I wonder whether you think why uh, they didn't actually, I never thought about it this way, why, why they didn't go, you know, try to work it up to the Supreme Court, whether they thought the Supreme Court would just not be friendly to it, whether different doctrines at the time. And, and uh, a sidebar to that question is uh, a lot of people would like to overturn Citizens United, and there's a lot of talk about how you do that, what the strategy would be. Uh, you're not necessarily someone who's going to be an activist in that, though I hope you are, but, but you know, do you think it makes sense to try to go through the amendment process or to work state by state in this way and, yeah. and basically to, to repeat right. what these three groups right. have done? So great question, and, and, and that's right. I mean, the, the, uh, particularly the women's suffrage movement used a, a very similar incremental state-based strategy to build momentum before they... Um, uh, got women's suffrage at the federal level. They got it through at, at, the, at many state levels by the time it went to the... Prohibition, uh, too. I think a majority of states had passed prohibition before the 18th Amendment. Yeah, yeah. And, and the gay rights groups studied the, those, those campaigns in their determination that they essentially needed to reach a, a tipping point before they could go sort of jump the tracks and move from the state to the federal Level, you know, at, at one point, I mean, the constitutional amendment process is extraordinarily difficult, as we know, and uh, it's always been difficult, but it's only gotten more difficult. I mean, it's almost impossible to pass legislation now, so to pass an amendment is 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 uh, you know, the, the the last amendment that passed was the twenty seventh amendment, um, and it uh, I can't remember exactly when it passed, but it basically says that members of Congress cannot vote themselves a raise. Uh, you know, and then take the raise. They have to vote it for, you know, the next uh, uh, office seekers. That amendment was proposed, I think, in 1789 uh, and adopted in 1980 or something like that. So it's a sl talk about slow, you know, incrementalism. It, it's, it's tough to go the amendment route. And of course, constitutional law has changed dramatically, but largely through the courts. Um, uh, uh, in part, I think, because the amendment process is so difficult. But my uh, argument really is that whether you're going through the, uh, the sort of explicitly democratic amendment process or the not explicitly democratic constitutional interpretation um, uh, process, you have to do the same kind of work. As to Citizens United, I think that is one of the um, likely, um, uh, it, it, well, it already is a target uh, of a, a, a group of um, of important uh, and, and I think effective organizations. They are, they are engaged in a lot of this kind of work. I, I have a piece in this month's Atlantic that, um, that really applies the lessons of this book to that kind of campaign. And you know, I think, I think it's quite, quite likely that over time, in, in our lifetimes, Citizens United, whether, whether it's literally overturned or not, will be radically um, uh, limited in its uh, in its restriction on the uh, on the ability of the legislature to impose limits on money in, in, in campaigns. But it will, again, it will be done not by a constitutional amendment, although one has been proposed. It will be done not by a dramatic you know run for office by Larry Lessig uh, on a you know campaign to uh, uh, to overturn Citizens United. It'll be done through the same kind of incremental, often state-based um, uh, kinds of uh, of, of efforts that, cha that, that change people's views. Um, it's, it's more difficult with respect to Citizens United than with respect, I think, to gay marriage or gun rights because you're trying to um, cut back on a right that has been recognized uh, as opposed to trying to um, create a right that has not been recognized. And, and the, why that's more difficult uh, is because when a right has not been recognized, it's free to the states to recognize that right. So the fact that the court hadn't, the Supreme Court hadn't recognized marriage equality didn't stop Massachusetts from recognizing marriage equality. But once a right is recognized at the federal level, it preempts a lot of, uh, of efforts at the state level because um, they will violate uh, that, the First Amendment right to, of corporations and other rich people to spend as much as they want. So you have to engage in a kind of more incremental, even more incremental strategy. But the folks that um, fought Roe versus Wade uh, have done precisely that uh, since Roe was decided, and I think most people would say 
Roe has not been overturned, but it's been ra radically cut back, and, and that's because of the work of the pro-choice, I mean the pro-life um, movement, notwithstanding significant efforts on the other side from pro-choice. Pro um, and matter of fact, I was just going to raise that point about uh, the Roe and, and its opposition. Um, the two examples of, of, of rights created that you, uh, your two examples of um, <clears throat> gun control and uh, marriage equality, um, of course there are organized groups opposing both of those. Uh, whether they were as well financed or as well organized is a different matter. Yep. Uh, certainly the Brady group was not, not as much power as, as, as the NRA. Um, so do you think, do you foresee a, a similar rise of, uh, as in the anti row uh, 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 organizations, uh, it seems to be a, a uh, anti-marriage equality rising also. I don't see, and I, I don't know what it'll be as effective, yeah. but what, what do you so, think? So, and, and, so, yeah. I, I don't see it happening with the gun control, however. Yeah. So, so, um, so, I mean, one lesson of all of this is that, you know, the, the, these fights are never over. The fact that the court recognizes a right doesn't necessarily, doesn't end the uh, the, the conversation in, in any way, um, you know, the, the, as, as the pro-life movement has shown with respect to Roe versus Wade. Uh, with respect to gun rights, uh, that conversation is not over. Uh, the NRA is not really ha not that happy with the Supreme Court's decision recognizing the right to bear arms because it didn't really specify what the sort of standard of review is for gun laws. It um, said, as it was recognizing an individual right, that a whole host of gun laws, which were not an issue in the case, were clearly constitutional. Um, and uh, so, um, and, and for the most part, uh, gun rights claims that have been filed in federal courts since, um, uh, since Heller uh, have been unsuccessful. So, you know that so and mayor bloomberg has started a group called every town um, for gun safety uh, which is in some sense modeled on the nra model of a local uh, uh, you know sort of locally affiliated uh, organizations with a kind of national um, uh, coordination the problem with the one problem with the brady campaign and the other gun rights groups is that they focused on Washington. They didn't have uh, a, a very significant local uh, presence. And so when the NRA went to the states to fight for changing the state constitutional, uh, state constitutions and state laws to protect guns, there was nobody on the other side. Uh, well, now, you know, there, there is somebody on the other side. And, and uh, so, you know, I think these, these things are, um, I mean, again, the point of the book is that that's where constitutional law happens. It happens in the work of you know, organizations like the NRA and every town for uh, gun safety, uh, NARAL, uh, you know, and the um, pro-life uh, organizations, the gay rights groups, and the you know Mormon and and and, and Catholic Church that uh, that that funded a lot of the uh, opposition. And um, it's never over. But that's you know that's that's part of. Uh, what I think is um, exciting about constitutional law, that's part of what keeps the Constitution current, is that it reflects not just what somebody, you know, some group of dead white men wrote down on paper 240 years ago, but what we as a society continue uh, to believe are our most fundamental principles, and those principles change over time, and it's we who change them, um, not, the, uh, not the court. All right. Well, thank you very much. Again, thank you for coming. <laughs>